dark out here. Why don't you take your hat off so we have a little more light on the situation here? <laughs> they could tease each other all they wanted, but they were very tight knit and they loved each other a lot. Hey, Bill, turn around. Let me get you from the back again. Bill was just an incredibly likable guy. That's enough. Come on. You know, fed your chicken to not quit. When they first got married, everything was kind of going along the way that it should.
in Louisiana. Before Bill was a Marine, he was a pipe fitter. And so when he got out of the Marines, he just went back into pipe fitting. Bill meets Social Security Administrator Charlotte Hagen at church, and the pair tie the knot at Charlotte's parents' house just seven months later. It was a fun wedding. Charlotte was uh, very much in love with Bill. She seemed very, very happy. You are supposed to be the next person in line to get married when you catch the garter. When Bill threw the garter, he threw it right at me, and I didn't really have a chance to do anything. There was a lot of, lot of people there at the wedding, at the reception. So it was a good crowd. Bill looks good. He was young. Everybody's happy, healthy. Those were magical times right there. We just didn't realize it at the time. I miss those times. <laughs> Fast forward to November 18th, 1988. 18 months after Bill's wedding, the Hudnall family gathers to celebrate the marriage of Tim and his bride, Brenda. My wedding day, Brenda's family was there and it was just a great day. We had a good time, and it was exciting to get married. And Bill was very excited for my wedding. Bill lines up as one of his brother's groomsmen in the United Pentecostal Church in Gainesville, Florida. The first time I met Bill was at my wedding rehearsal. My first impression was that he really, really loved his family. He was so proud of his brother. Um, and, and honored to be in the wedding. And he treated me like family the minute I met him. He helped calm my nerves about some of the things going on with the wedding. So instant brotherhood. Bill attends his brother's wedding alone. He split from his wife, Charlotte, in 1987 after less than a year of marriage. Charlotte was a very devoted wife and she took care of Bill. And uh, when Bill and Charlotte didn't work it out, we all definitely thought it was a loss and that Bill had let probably the best woman for him just kind of slip through the cracks. He dated uh, a number of girls and then just, I guess they weren't what, uh, what he was looking for. Bill's life takes a positive turn when he meets 20-year-old Stephanie Hall. Bill and Stephanie met, and they went on a date. Dad had asked him what he was going to do because he didn't have any money. And so Bill told him he was going to do a picnic lunch by a lake there. They dated once or twice, and then she ended up getting pregnant. Bill and Stephanie agreed to marry. The couple ties the knot in January 1991. Baby Joshua arrives on Valentine's Day. A year later, Stephanie gives birth to a daughter, Guinevere. Bill loved his kids. He took good care of them. And he always talked about the things he would do with the kids. You know, he'd bring them to the park, bring them different places, and do things with them. He was trying to provide for his kids. But he never pretended that the relationship was okay. So as their family grew, Stephanie quit her job because she felt like she needed to be at home watching the children. Bill was the sole breadwinner, even though he was happy to do it. You could always tell that he felt like there was a deficit because she would not work. She wanted to be pampered. She wanted to be spoiled. She wanted to be given things. And she wasn't willing to lift a finger for it. And it was just a bad situation. Billy's home in Louisiana. During the holidays, we would always
always spend Christmas with Billy or we'd go to my parents' home. Alright. This is to Joe from Mom. Joe films his daughter Jessica as she helps her Uncle Tim with the presents. We had wonderful Christmases, large gatherings, a lot of food, all the kids playing together, you know, the passing out of the presents. Everything was usually very lighthearted and very fun, and they, everybody was always joking about something you never knew. To Rebecca from Uncle Joe, I and
While Bill is away working, Stephanie decides to homeschool the kids without consulting her husband. I think she didn't want to send the kids to school because she didn't want them going in and talking about home life, how she took care of her household, her kids, her lack of. The house was in squalor. The children didn't have any new clothes. I had been trying to get Bill to leave Stephanie for years and take his kids with him. But Bill would never leave Stephanie because he looked at it as her having the ability to get a good attorney to fight about it. And I told him, I said, Bill, it's not like that anymore. The state of Florida has laws in place that ensure that you're going to see your kids. Why in the world would you stick around somebody like that? It wasn't shortly after that that him and Stephanie did finally split up. When Bill moved out, initially she would let the kids visit. However, if they would tell their dad they loved him, Stephanie would say, look at this house. Your dad never does anything for us. This is all his fault. He never gives money to support you. And he doesn't love you. One time when Guinevere was visiting, Bill offered to get her classes in the community college and Stephanie put a stop to it and said, no, you're not gonna do that. Stephanie didn't want Guinevere to do anything outside of her control. And college would mean that she would be outside of her control. In May 2011, 19-year-old Guinevere goes to Uncle Tim and Aunt Brenda's house to hang out with her cousins. Guinevere actually was only allowed to stay over one time, and Stephanie called constantly. So I actually took the phone and turned it off, and I told Guinevere that I'll deal with her mother about it. And that emboldened Guinevere to tell me about how she wanted to try to branch out on her own and do her own thing. Uh, Tim and I offered to take Guinevere out of that situation and let her move in with us. When it came time to actually leave, I called her, told her we were coming, and she said she did, was not going to leave because her mother needed her. And we were very concerned. We couldn't make her leave. Our hands were tied. My husband and I knew that it was just going to be downhill from there.
situation and Gwen was quite the opposite. The first thing that came to mind was the possibility of both being in shock. When you find people that are in shock, some will be over exaggerated and some will have no emotion whatsoever. I was at home and I get a phone call from Guinevere. She said, Aunt Brenda, something has happened to dad. I said, what do you mean something has happened to dad? And she said, he's dead. Somebody broke in and killed him. When we arrived, I was able to speak to Stephanie and Guinevere when we got to the scene. We needed them to know that we were going to be there for them. I had Detective Phillips and Detective Viscani start interviewing both Stephanie and Gwen on scene to get their stories. Stephanie claims that she discovered Bill's body when she returned his truck earlier that morning. She says that she and Gwen had borrowed the truck the night before. Stephanie advised that she and Gwen had gone to the home of Bill in the Mustang to pick up his vehicle to borrow it the following day to take Gwen to different massage schools in Ocala as the Mustang that they had did not run very good and the air conditioner didn't work well. Stephanie stated that she left by 8, 8.30, and she drove the Mustang home because the taillights didn't work in it, and she wanted to have it home before dark. And she said that Gwen then drove Bill's vehicle home, and she was home somewhere between 9 and 9.30 that evening. Next, detectives interview Gwen Hudnall. The story that Gwen gave was that they were there to pick up the vehicle to take a door off to go to the local dump. Gwen said she drove her Mustang home and her mom drove her dad's car home. Detective Phillips asked Gwen if she and her mom made it to the dump the following morning. Gwen replies, no. We realized that they had conflicting stories. Their stories were inconsistent on the reason why they were borrowing the vehicle, who drove the vehicle home the night before, and that made us believe that we needed to look more into these two as possibly being involved in this. They were asked by the detectives to come in originally to do elimination fingerprints and DNA. While they were there doing that, they were asked if they would speak to me as I'm the lead detective on the case. Detective Myers interviews Stephanie first. Start me at the very beginning on you guys going over there the other night. We had talked to him about um, borrowing the truck to go because we wanted to go to Ocala. So about what time again did you leave? Uh, it was probably about 8.15. Mm -hmm. On the yeah, in the Mustang, yeah. Then about what time would you say Gwen made it home? Probably about 9, 9.30-ish. Stephanie's account matches what she told Detective Phillips the day before. Then I asked her what transpired that morning and then from there, from there we went to the dump to drop off the door. Um, went on into town because both of us needed gas, and then we went on to um, to Hawthorne. Um, she had asked me if she could um, stop and get something to drink, and then by the time she got to the house, I had already I was already on the phone with nine one one. Okay. <laughs> What's all over the bed, honey? Detective Myers interviews Gwen next. Take me 
through the entire thing. Okay. Um, we went over there Wednesday night to pick up the truck and kind of borrow it. And then mom left around eight in the Mustang. What was the purpose of going to get the truck? To take such a job. She changed her story. Her story was completely different than what she had told the detectives in the day prior. I could be wrong, but I thought Detective Phillips had told me that you guys did not go to the dump. Did you tell her that, or do you remember? Um, I think I might have told her that, but then, I, like, I was like, oh, snap, we went to the dump, we dropped off the door, and that's all we did. Like, I, I forgot we dropped off the door all the way there. Everything in Gwen's interview now was beginning to slowly match up to Stephanie's interview. It was obvious to me one or both of them were lying. Tom, this this right here is Gwen. And Hi Gwen, I'm Tom Wilder. Nice to meet you. Um, he's, he's the polygraph examiner today. Okay. I'll, I'll leave you guys. Yeah, they, it was a thought of mine to do a polygraph due to the fact that both of their statements had been inconsistent from the very beginning. Um, my role here as a polygraph examiner today is to uh, help you say not only did Gwen have nothing to do with his death, Gwen is not the kind of person who would have something to do with his death, okay? Gwen must answer each of the examiner's questions, either yes or no. Her test is scheduled to take 90 minutes. This is about to begin. It's today, Friday. Yes. Regarding the murder of that man, do you intend to answer each question truthfully? Yes. Before 2010, did you ever hurt anyone? No. Did you participate in any way in the death of that man? No. When you tell a lie on a polygraph, your blood pressure goes up, your breathing gets sporadic, um, your hands get a little sweatier. Well, I'm pretty sure that's all I'm gonna need. So let me go ahead and get that stuff off of me and then sit back down here while I school, okay? The examiner ends the test after just 19 minutes. Did I have to say I was uh, kind of surprised and uh, after speaking with you, but not a doubt in my mind at all that you were involved in the death of your dad. Not a doubt in my mind at all. I am? Absolutely. Absolutely. He confronted her with the fact that she was being deceptive and was lying about what happened. Gwen, you did. I swear to you, I didn't do it. There's not a doubt in my mind, not a doubt in my mind that you did. She was called out flat on it, and he knew that she was involved in this. Tell me the truth, Gwen. Tell me the truth. It happened. That made you have to do this. What happened, sweetheart? I'm losing everything. No. 
knows what I did. He knows that I did it. help be- 
because they were losing their home. Gwen said that it was because of her father that they were getting evicted from the house in Keystone. And it was obvious she would not know any of this had this not been told to her and put in her mind by Stephanie, her mom. So what was the plan for that night when you went over there? I did believe that it was pre-planned between the two of them that Gwen was going to kill Bill. There was not a doubt in my mind that Stephanie knew that she was driving Gwen to go kill Bill on that night. The two of them were arrested that evening on the homicide charges of Bill Hudnall. Gwen agrees to a deal with prosecutors to testify against her mother. It would have been more difficult to convict Stephanie uh, without Gwen's testimony. Uh, Gwen is the one that lays out the level of her involvement and the level of her planning. Gwen admitted that the murder was premeditated. We also knew that Stephanie was culpable and highly involved and that she assisted Gwen in committing this murder and she helped plan with Gwen to commit this murder and she helped to cover up the murder by the burning of the clothes and coming up with stories to tell law enforcement. Prosecutors pieced together what led Gwen Hudnall to murder her father. Stephanie had gotten in Gwen's head that the two of them were going to get rid of Bill so they could get his social security check. Stephanie made Gwen feel like this was the only way for the two of them to make it financially. Gwen went there with the intent to kill her dad because it was going to make her mom and her lives easier without him being alive. She went and got the pickaxe, walked into the bedroom, behind him where he was sleeping and started hitting him with the axe. The job done, Stephanie helps cover her daughter's tracks. Stephanie cuts a deal when she learns that her daughter will testify against her. Both women agree with prosecutors to plead guilty to second degree murder. They took a plea bargain down to second degree and she gave her mother up because we as a family said it was more important to us that her mother get charged with this than it was for Guinevere to be put to death. On Tuesday, September 25th, 2012, a judge at Alachua County Criminal Justice Center in Gainesville sentences both Stephanie and Gwen to 40 years in prison. Why don't you take your hat off so we have a little more light on the situation here? <laughs> Bill was all about family, and he was a good friend. And he was a great brother-in-law, or brother. And I'm going to miss him, and I do miss him. I love Bill. He was my brother. You know, I believe he made a lot of bad choices. But even in his bad choices, he still meant well. I remember Bill now, like when we were kids or teenagers. And we always kind of threw rocks at each other, you know, and joking and teasing, you know, but, you know, we loved each other. He was a good brother, you know.